uh, just as a pro tip, if you are going to do a Kickstarter, try not to end it the same week you're giving a talk. It does leave you kind of low on free time to actually adjust, let's say. Um, <laughs> I did it again. Do you want me to do your content warnings really quick? My what? Content warnings. Oh, yeah. um, general discussion of patterns of discrimination and bias and um, binary gender language because of research. I'll talk about that research. in a minute. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, hello. Um, my goal today is for us to learn to talk a little bit about the dominant masculinity of the tech industry um, and to give it some historical context and then also to understand why things are like this. Um, I want to state up front that I do not have the intent of making anyone feel bad about their gender. Uh, gender is a complex topic. Uh, a lot of the research that I'm relying on uses very binary language to talk about these kinds of issues. Uh, where possible, I'm going to try to focus on masculinity and not masculinity, but sometimes the research is going to talk about you know this percentage men, this percentage women, and I know that there are people that are left in a, a gap there or underrepresented. So uh, to talk about masculinity and technology, um, what I'm saying is that technology is by default coded masculine. Uh, that we generally, maybe not us in this room, but people generally believe that it is work that men do, that it has a masculine nature. Um, and when women do this work, women are less visible. Uh, and femininity is not something that's transferred to that work product. So to be a software developer as a woman does not make your code feminine unless people are usually meaning that in a really negative way. Um, and it also translates to things like we hire code ninjas and code rock stars and we have very male personas for that as opposed to we hire code divas or code princesses. So I just want to give some examples of this uh, dominant narrative and uh, what it might look like. So you know, I asked Google, what does a software developer look like? I got some pictures like this that are fairly uniform. Uh, and I might look for job ads and see you know, what a job ads say about software developers. And this ad says that they are going to hire a PHP guy who drinks Jolt and eats Twix. Um, I might look at something like the percentage of women who receive computer science degrees, and that definitely doesn't include all programmers. Um, but it's declined a lot over time, and it's currently under 20%. And it's declined relative to other STEM uh, degree options as well. I might look at a broader measure, you know, to look at all possible computing occupations. Um, and the highest point that's been recorded for this is 36% women. Um, that includes developers and DBAs and researchers, and that was in 1991. Uh, currently, or as of about a year ago, it could be measured at 25%, with white women having the largest share of that. This is a little retro, but you know, when we look at marketing for computers, we see things that often show men working on them, uh, or perhaps women, you know, looking on from the kitchen. <laughs> Um, and, you know, emphasizing like the, the learning goals or the professional goals that men might achieve through having these computers. Uh, and then the last part of this that I want to look at is that uh, not all masculinities are represented in this mold usually. Um, what tends to be reinforced is the idea of men who are white, straight, cis, able-bodied, and young such as Mark Zuckerberg. So, you know, with all of this evidence in front of us, we might feel like this is a really solid narrative. We might feel that it, it sticks, that it affects us, or even, like, infects us, personally. Um, and if we don't fit into that dominant masculinity that I've been talking about, we might just erase ourselves from the conversation. We might feel both left out and like we should leave ourselves out. So if you're under the age of 30, you know, I just said like 1991 was this high point for uh, professions. If you're under the age of 30, you have never seen a different industry. You've never experienced something different. This is how it's always been. And you wouldn't have any reason to believe otherwise, right? You know, we know what we see and what we've experienced. So let's try to figure out how we got here. We're going to go back in history some. Uh, you know, Ada Lovelace, right? We, uh, I'm going to skip, actually, 
past that. <laughs> we could start here, but we're going to um, go to World War II. So uh, the modern profession of computing really grows out of this um, set of needs in World War II around ballistics calculations. So if you are going to fire an artillery shell at somebody, you need to be able to adjust for the, um, the trajectory given the weather conditions and all these things. So they created these tables that told people how exactly to aim the thing. Um, and the way that they created the tables is that they hired computers, who were women, <laughs> uh, to do the calculations. Uh, these women were often young. They, some of them were recent college graduates or even high school students. They were hired because they had math skills, you know, kind of a prerequisite. Um, but they were also viewed as interchangeable. You'll see people, uh, you'll see references that refer to them as sort of a categorical class <laughs> rather than individual workers. Um, and the reason that so many women were employed doing this is that men who might have done the work otherwise were elsewhere in the war effort, right? Were assigned to different kinds of work. Um, this wasn't considered really an intellectual job, uh, but it's repetitive, it's focused. And in a lot of cases, the machines that these calculations were performed on, it was we transitioned from completely manual to um, slightly more electronic calculation. The machines were designed by men who often got the credit for the results. So uh, coming out of this, in 1946, six women were recruited to work on the ENIAC, uh, which is often considered to be the first general purpose computing machine. ENIAC uh, filled the same kind of role. It was uh, designed to calculate ballistics tables. Uh, the women that worked on it, they didn't have a programming manual. Um, they actually had to sit there and learn the system. They were presented with this thing and their role was to figure out how to use it to uh, do these calculations. And they also didn't have a written programming language to rely on. This is an entirely physical <laughs> interface. They used the cables and the switches to program it. Uh, and they also were not credited for the work until uh, much later, like in, in my recent memory later. So, you know, coming out of the war effort uh, with the example of ENIAC, um, a lot of these, these same uh, sets of calculations, calculating machines, uh, started to form into a technology industry. And, you know, uh, similarly to the ballistics tables, it focused on data processing. Women were uh, hired as operators and coders of these systems, and that work was considered to be clerical. It was, it was uh, we talk about feminized labor today. Uh, it would be a kind of feminized labor. And also, as the machines, you know, gained complexity and there were more of them out there, you would see a division between what the women did, which was coding, and what the men did, which was programming, which is more like program design or system design. Uh, and this was reflected in job titles. This was reflected in you know, the roles that were assigned, who did what. But women as coders actually did the debugging and the troubleshooting. And if you're a programmer, I don't know, I feel like that's actually a huge part of what that means. Um, and one of the, the interesting reactions that came from that is that sometimes the men they were working with went, wow, this is just a lot more complicated than I thought to do it right. They go, <laughs> yeah, you know, we had to debug it. Um, so this recruitment of women continued all the way into the 1960s. Um, this is an article from Cosmopolitan that makes the rounds every so often. It's basically saying, young women, have a career in programming. Go for it. Uh, and there was kind of a, a slew of these articles that were focused on the idea that the software industry needed more labor. Um, so into this time period, into the 1960s, the idea that there were these women coders who came in and they did data processing and you know made the numbers go, it started to shift into a couple of other designations. Um, so one of them is something I've heard called the computer boys. Uh, which were computer programmers that worked in this professional business environment. Um, and then the other one is the idea of a computer hacker. And that's shown with the phone freakers in the top right corner here. Um, yeah, the computing industry was growing. Companies were trying to expand their workforce rapidly. Um, they started writing all these pieces about how they had a labor shortage. And because there weren't enough existing programmers, 
to take those jobs. I mean, everybody accounted them up, came to this conclusion. Companies were trying to figure out how to recruit uh, people they could train. So they turned to things like aptitude tests. Uh, and the aptitude test questions, they tended to focus on some particular skills, um, like this uh, math puzzle problem. They uh, didn't do this because anybody had shown that it was an effective way to screen candidates, but it was more that they thought, well, there's just so many people out there that could potentially get hired for this job, let's filter them down somehow. And so the effect, rather than increasing gender equality by increasing the potential pool of candidates, you know, we let everybody apply and then we screen them and then some people come through, the tests tended to reinforce various biases. Um, and so these biases were things like a programmer must have formal mathematics training. Uh, a programmer tends to have an antisocial personality. And, you know, strangely enough, women didn't screen as successfully. Um, the idea of a, a hacker programmer um, came out of uh, phone freaking, the uh, practice of um, tricking the phone line into giving you free long distance. <laughs> uh, the tech model train club at MIT, this is kind of a notorious group that you'll read about. Um, and the homebrew computer club in California where uh, Steve and Steve here got their start. The kind of masculinity that was emphasized um, by this, this cultural persona um, was one that involved creativity, cleverness, and rule breaking. So then, uh, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, this computing world expanded from the big business systems, the data processing systems, to include personal computers and game consoles. And the marketing efforts for these systems uh, focused on an idea called market segmentation. They uh, chose to promote them specifically as suitable for boys, desirable for boys. Um, and it, I've read some interesting marketing stuff about like, why market segmentation helps you sell things more effectively. I've got a link in my notes. Um, I found it kind of enlightening to explain why this would seem like a logical path to take. But the flip side of it is that any time a marketer wants to explain that a computer is not for boys, they tend to make it hot pink. And I grew up in that environment, you know, that I, environment that reinforced that boys got these computers and girls sometimes got pink things. Um, and as a young woman, I was told that we should resist that through girl power. You know, Spice Girls here. <laughs> um, and, and sort of this counter argument of, well, you can do it, but I can do it better. Um, and I've really found that unsatisfying the older I've gotten. Uh, and what I've started to shift toward thinking about is how we renormalize gender diversity in tech and how we address the structural impacts of these biases. So just to come back to that big picture, I mean, we're talking about a field programming or software engineering that was created and defined by women. Uh, Margaret Hamilton here actually came up with the term. She wanted to demonstrate that software engineering was just as important as hardware engineering. Uh, so, you know, we start here and we end up with technology companies that look like this, uh, you know, row after row of fairly similar white men. There's just one other piece of research that I want to throw in here. Um, there was a study done that tried to look at the ratio of men and women in a group and the perception by people of different genders about those groups. Um, and so what they came up with was that when there were 17% women, this was like that was the point, the men in the group tended to think that the proportions were 50-50. And once they reached 33% women in the group, men thought that there were more women in the room than men. And when I looked at that and I looked at the um, statistics around computer science degrees or employment, I thought, well, <laughs> this might explain a few things, right? You know, if we send out you know, like 18% uh, CS degrees and that goes into the hiring pool, there are probably people that look at that and feel like that's balanced. And that's, you know, that's an assumption that I want to challenge personally when I look at a room now. I actually sometimes count <laughs> to show myself like, am I making the wrong assumption here? So what I've come to realize is that the masculinity of technology is something that's constructed. 
And it's constructed through a series of processes. Um, it's constructed through erasure, through forgetting women's roles in programming. Uh, it's constructed through moving goalposts, like with aptitude tests that uh, promote some skills over others and don't look at the full picture of who might be qualified. Um, and it's promoted through the kinds of narratives that we describe, the stories that we tell. Uh, and I um, found this photo. This woman is Christine Darden. She worked at Langley Research Center from 1967 to 2007. Uh, it's a pretty long career. Um, and I found her information through something called the Human Computer Project, which is an effort to document all of the women that have been human computers uh, making calculations. And I just, I was so amazed at how many names were in there. I hadn't really thought of it beyond like, oh, there's this one photo of some women <laughs> doing ballistics tables this one time. And to see that there was an entire directory just kind of it expanded my own concept of just how big of a thing that actually was. How are we on time? Are we? We're good? Okay. Uh, so the next thing that I have, I want to do a little discussion. Um, and I'm going to ask you if you're comfortable. You don't have to do this if you don't want to. But if you're comfortable, I want to ask you to turn to somebody next to you and to talk to them about a couple of questions. Do we have like five minutes or ten minutes or ten minutes? Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to give you two questions and then maybe discuss, and then I'll give you two more. So the first question I want to think about is who benefits from inequality? Um, I think that when you are part of the majority, that's actually pretty awesome. <laughs> that's an awesome experience. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of ways that you might feel that it reinforces the idea that your skills are good and that, um, you know, you might be well compensated as a result. But I also think we might talk about how companies benefit from inequality. And then the other part of this that I want to ask is, what's the downside to creating more equality? Um, what detriments does it have to an individual or to a company? Go forth, discuss. All right, I bet you're having really awesome discussions, really awesome discussions, but please pause. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to a second pair of questions, and if I do this right, we might even have one minute to get people to tell us what they learned. Maybe? Okay. Um, all right, so uh, the next set of things I want to ask is, what's the new narrative that we would need? Um, and what would it feel like to see true gender diversity in our field? Those might be kind of part of the same thing. And I also want to ask what we have to give up to get there. Does anybody have something they want to share that they learned? Hello. So um, we talked about the reasons. OK, so what do we have to give up to get there? So gender diversity is not about gender. It is about other things besides gender, including race and gender identity and a bunch of other things, especially race. So what do we have to give up to get there, I think, is for my fellow white folks in the room, is we have to give up the, f the idea that we should be speaking all of the time. Anyone else? Um, I, what we talked about and I think is also kind of important is for people who generally don't like to make waves and don't need to, to do it for the people that need that voice and that support in order to make them feel like they belong there just as much as people who look like they belong there. We talked a little bit about the, uh, you know, a new narrative and the industry is built on copying successes and so a few breakthrough successes from diverse teams can really start to move the needle on it. I think make it, make it see diversity as a strength rather than a weakness. Thank you. Um, so if you had a really good discussion, I would love it if you emailed me about it because I'm just so interested in people's answers to these questions and how, uh, how we can use conversations like this to get from the, you know, the sort of current state of things to maybe where we do want to be. Um, if you thought this was interesting, you should check out uh, issue four of the recompiler. Not that I'm biased or anything, but there's an article on uh, the erasure of women from these early programming narratives. Um, also, a book that I relied on heavily is The Computer Boys Takeover. It talks about the development of 
uh, programming or software engineering as a profession. Um, and it has some really interesting commentary, not just on gender, but other aspects of it. Uh, you may have heard about Hidden Figures. It focuses on the role of women and specifically African-American women at NASA in uh, taking that ballistics computing expertise and building the space program. And there's a movie coming out. The trailer's amazing. Um, you can also go look at the Human Computer Project and just browse. I, I mean, I encourage it. Just go and browse and click on some names and read what they did. Um, and then finally, I've got my email here. So yeah, email me. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>